Now we're gonna go ahead and talk about managing production and development environments. Now this is really important to ensure that you don't really mess anything up in production. You do all of the messing up in development and to separate these things are really important. So this is gonna include actually provisioning servers necessary for the two environments, as well as environment variables, something to secure our keys and all of the passwords we don't want to get out there. So let's go ahead and take a look first by setting up our production and development database servers. Now we need to set up our production database server to actually accept requests from our various application servers. And of course, that's these three IP addresses here, not the load balancer, but the application server itself. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna come into our root of our project and I'm gonna call inventory.ini or INI. So this file here is actually used for Ansible, which is something we would wanna to work towards for automating a lot of these things. Uh, but for now, I'm actually not gonna do that. I'm gonna go ahead and say web app, um, like the web app group, and I'm gonna grab each one of these IP addresses here. And this is really just for my own reference. It's not something I'm actually gonna be implementing just yet. Obviously, I could jump into the console if I really needed to. And so what I wanna do is actually go into my Postgres SQL production database server, and we wanna do a couple of things. First off, let's go ahead and SSH in here. And the thing that I wanna do is ensure that my firewall allows each one of these in. So we'll go ahead and do sudo UFW and status numbered. Okay, so what we have right here is literally just one of them. So if you remember, it's actually a fairly easy command to use. So we can do sudo UFW allow and then from, and then the next IP address to any port 5432. Now, of course, if we did change the default ports, you would wanna change it there as well. And the protocol or proto is TPC or TCP, excuse me. And then um, we're gonna do that same process again for the next IP address. Okay, and here we go. And hit enter or maybe scroll to the end and then hit enter. And then again, we'll go ahead and look at the status. And now all of those are allowed in as connections. Okay, great. So that solves that problem, but what it doesn't solve is actually testing our database prior to going into production. So this actually brings me to the next point of, hey, what if we duplicated our database server? So it's identical in our development environment as well as our production environment. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'm gonna clone this and I'm gonna do exactly the same thing, it, the same region, or actually this time you could use the region really close to you. In my case, it'd be Dallas, Texas, um, but I'm gonna use the same region just to keep things simplified. This time it's gonna be Postgres dev server, or really we should probably do dev Postgres server one. That way we know for sure, hey, this is a development server that I'm probably gonna wanna get rid of almost immediately after testing some things. And so this is duplicating it. And the actual TCP or the firewall actually is preventing my local machine from grabbing that. So yet again, what I'm gonna be doing is coming into this dev server once it's finished creating and it does power on. Um, we're gonna go in there and just allow all of these items access, including my local machine. And so this is also a pretty easy thing to do. So let's go ahead and jump in. Now, the main thing that we wanna think about here though is when we are done with this server, what we're gonna wanna do is delete it. Like, so if you do some tests, you do some code, you're gonna to wanna to delete that server, otherwise you're gonna be paying for it every single month or as much as you have it up, which is good and bad. I mean, if you want it up all the time and it's just really easy, fine, but I'm gonna show you a strategy on how you don't have to keep it up all the time, but a lot of the results will be close to identical. Okay, so I'm gonna let this finish booting and then we'll come back. All right, so it finished booting. Let's go ahead and SSH in, and we're just gonna simply change our allow call 
Might have to let that wait another minute. Okay, and so we say yes, of course. Now again, sudo ufw and status numbered should be the exact same, right? But of course now I just wanna allow all of them. So sudo ufw and allow 5432 and TCP, we hit enter. Now my local machine should have access to it. I could totally delete the other ones if I wanted to, but that's not really necessary at this point. Okay, so I'm not gonna actually test this database just yet, so I'll exit out of here. But what I will do instead is I'm gonna go ahead and come into images here, and we're gonna go ahead and create a new image based off of this. And we wanna save it as is. You do get charged for this depending on the size of it, of course. Um, but again, we're gonna go ahead and call this our dev Postgres SQL server, right? So basically our development environment with UFW allowed for 5432 everywhere. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and create that image. And from here, now, whenever I need to pull down this dev server, I can do that. I can just delete it. It won't be charging me $5 a month. Instead, it'll be charging me something like, I don't know, 10 cents, maybe 20 cents a month, maybe 50 cents a month. But it's not gonna charge me very much to bring this up. Now, do keep in mind that we could continuously make new images of this, especially if we start to add data into this development server. I'm not gonna cover that part just yet, but all you need to do is just, you know, snap, take an image of it like I just did. Uh, going into images and then creating an image and then getting whatever the current state of it is, um, which is cool. That's a nice way to just think about how you're going to end up using your future development environment. Now, you could totally take images of your production database server as well in a, as a form of, you know, sort of backing it up. Although I would recommend potentially having some sort of job like a cron job to back up your database server to maybe object storage or something like that, something that I'm not gonna cover at this point. So bringing in an actual full-on backup in there, encrypted as much as you can um, to make that happen. Okay, cool. So now that we've got this, let's just go ahead and SSH into it. Now it should still have all my keys and everything like that. Great, so it does. So if I deleted this and started a new one, it would totally work well as well. So um, now that I have this image, I'm just gonna show you what you would do is you'd come in here and then deploy to a new Linode. It grabs that image. You can choose the region you wanna deploy it to, the plan. So if you need it bigger, you can totally make it bigger. Uh, and then all these other things, right? So like you would with any sort of normal image, much like we did with our Debian images before. These are just our now custom images, which I think makes things a little bit easier for managing these development environment Postgres servers. Um, the other part of this that is really nice is our credentials for it. And so I think I, yeah, I left in the actual credentials right here. These should still be those same exact credentials for it. Um, and if it's not, then we would of course have to go back and update some things. But these credentials right here will allow me to access my dev server as well. Now, of course, and this is a huge, huge caveat, something I'm not gonna cover, you should have a different password for your development Postgres server than your production one. Hopefully that's well understood, but at the very least, I will set up something that will help us prevent any catastrophes happening as well. So let's go ahead and get into environment variables and our actual app into connecting to this server. All right, so now what we're gonna do is add in environment variables into our production web app server. So these are production environment variables so that our web app will have the credentials to connect to our Postgres database. And of course, we have this connection string here that we've already talked about. So that's really what I'm gonna be putting in here. So let's go ahead and jump in to one of these web app servers. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this one here and SSH in. And of course, I still have this password referenced here, so I'll do that. And so what we can do is we can do sudo nano and then put a new file into etc profile.d and just call it app config.sh. So this script will allow me to have environment variables. So I'll just do export and we'll call this app underscore db. And I'm just gonna put it equal to 
this string right here. I don't need, I don't actually need quotes or anything. This is actually just works just fine. And this will add this in as an environment variable. So we'll hit control X, Y and enter to save that. And then I'll just go ahead and do source slash ETC profile. And now if I go into like Python three, I can import OS. This will give me my environment variables and I can print out os.environ.git. And I think we called it app DB Hit enter. And there it is, right? And so let's go ahead and exit out of this and exit out of the actual server too. And I'm gonna go ahead and reboot this. And so what I want to do, the reason I'm rebooting this is to just ensure that that environment variable is going to stay in my production environment. And so this also gives me another opportunity to talk about what it is that I wanna do with the web app server itself. Going forward, after we can verify that that environment variable is in this web app server, I'm gonna make an image of it and replace these two with that image, or realistically replace these two IP addresses with that image. Now, of course, the reason I'm doing that has to do with the firewall that my Postgres database server has. So it is often a good idea to reserve potentially some more IP addresses if we need to horizontally scale really quickly. I'm not gonna be doing that, I won't need to. I think three servers is probably enough. Okay, so let's go ahead and SSH back into that original one and just verify our environment variables and grab this password here and then jump into Python 3, import OS, print out the os.environ.git and app db and there it is, great. So now let's go ahead and actually clone this web server one. In fact, I'm not gonna clone it initially. Instead, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it into an image. So create image, web server one, and then we'll just give it a web app dash server and web app server image for fast API. Go ahead and create that. And of course, it's gonna take some time that I'll let it finish happening in just a moment. But while that's creating, what we can actually see in any web app server, we can look at our network here and take a look at the IP address. And we see that I can actually transfer this IP address. And so that's actually what we wanna do. We wanna transfer it to a different Linode in the same data center. This will help us quite a bit. So we'll try that out in just a moment once our image is actually created which it will be done in just a second. So I'm gonna pause. Okay, so my web app server image has been created and notice that it is about two gigs. So it's 20 cents a month, not too bad. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and deploy this to a new Linode, same region. That's important for the IP transfer and the root password. I'm gonna go ahead and use the one I have been using as well as this SSH key. Okay, so let's go ahead and create that. Now, before I go any further, I'm gonna see if I can transfer it while it's being provisioned. Probably can't, but let's give it a shot. So in the network, IP transfer, move to, and we did not give this a proper name, did we? And it doesn't even look like we can transfer it just yet. Let's just verify what that name was. Yeah, so web app server US West. So we'll have to finish that one actually going up. But while that's happening, I'm gonna go ahead and create a, another image because we definitely need two of them. So deploy Linode and web app server, let's call this dash four or dash five, either way. We will rename these again back to what they were. And, you know, we could still put those tags in. That's not really that important right now. I'm gonna use that same password, SSH keys, and grab a nanode. And the region, Fremont. Okay, cool. There it goes. All right, so they pro finished provisioning. So we'll go ahead and jump into the first one, into the network, and IP transfer. We're gonna go ahead and swap with and let's find our web app 
server us. Okay, and we're gonna use that right there. We'll hit save and IP transferred successfully. So we're gonna exit out of here, go to settings and change this to dash old, save it and go back into our Linodes. And they should have actually swapped out. Uh, it's not showing up right now. They have the exact same one. So let's go ahead and refresh in here. And there we go. So it is swapped out. That should be the correct one, which we could also verify with our load balancer. I did make note of it and it looks like there it is right there. Okay, so this old one, I'm just gonna go ahead and delete. Okay, so now dash five, we wanna have this one swapped. We could use either one. I'm just gonna go to the original one, the source, go into IP transfer, select, swap with, and let's do web app, there we go, and then dash five, and hit save. Transfer it successfully, settings, and then dash old, save. We probably could just delete it now, but let's just verify um, that it's correct. So I'll refresh in here again, and now dash five should be the same IP as here, and sure enough it is. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and get rid of old, and let's just delete this. Now to ensure that the IP address is actually changed, we need to reboot each one of these. First off, what I'm gonna do is change them back to the other names, so web server two, and I'll go ahead and reboot this. And then we'll go back to the other one and rename this to web server three and reboot this. The actual name and IP address doesn't matter that much, of course, the label, uh, but rebooting it certainly does. Otherwise you will not be able to access the newly allocated IP address because all of the changes on that Linode have to actually you know, propagate. So now with that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into our web server here. The newest one will SSH in, and what we shouldn't see is the requirement for this password any longer because we added those SSH keys. So that's kind of a way to add it down the line is to just make an image and then reboot it with the SSH key in there. Cool, so let's go ahead and go into Python 3 here and we'll import OS, print out os.environ.git and apptb, what do you know? Cool. So I definitely could and probably should test it on the other application server, but I'm just gonna go ahead and assume that it's there and it's working. And also my load balancer should be back and working fully as well. So that's quite a lot of effort to change the environment variables for each web app server, but it is something that you might need to do up front. Really the environment variable configuration probably shouldn't change that often. And there might be other things that we could do for other kinds of environment variables. It doesn't have to be just the secrets in there because what we saw in the profile D, we can actually add in other files there that could contribute to environment variables as well. And that could be done through Git then. Now, of course, we actually need to set up our project, our actual application project to handle and use environment variables. So in requirements.txt, what I'm gonna do is add in a new requirement called python-env. And .env files are really nice for writing out environment variables. So what I wanna do here is inside of the app, I'm gonna make a new file called .env. Now, the reason we went through the production side of setting environment variables is so we don't have to ever add this file into Git. And that's important. We definitely do not want it in Git. So let's put it into Git ignore right now. In fact, any .env file we probably want to ignore as well. Okay, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and go back into this .env file and we wanna put in our database string. Now, this one right here should be our production database string, although the production string and the development string are almost the same except just a different IP. And then again, we'll call this app DV and we'll set it equal to that. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually make this the development environment one, which is that dev Postgres server here. I'll go ahead and copy that one and paste this in here. Great. 
Okay, so now I have these environment variables. How do I actually go about using them? Well, what we're gonna do is inside of our app, we're gonna make a new module called config.py. And in here, we're gonna add a couple of things. First off, we're gonna go ahead and import from func tools. We're gonna import, not tools, but tools, lru cache. And then from pydantic, we're gonna import the base settings class. And we're gonna go ahead and set up our own settings class with settings like this. Takes in base settings. And then we will give maybe the actual argument of app name being string or property. And we'll just call this my fast API app. Okay. And so inside of here, we can add another class called config and add the env file to where I want that env file, which is this right here. Okay. And so this env file is very common. Sometimes if you look in the documentation for python.env, you'll see another way to load in an env file. This is how you do it in FastAPI. It actually uses python.env by default to load in this environment variable file. But one of the biggest differences is the environment variables I wanna use in my app need to be declared here as well. So this app DB here, I need to actually bring it in like this. And if we do not want it required, we would just put it equal to none, but I actually do want it required. I definitely want my app DB in there. And so next up would be to actually get these settings and that is using LRU cache, this decorator around a function called get settings, which would return just an instance of the settings module here. And so the idea here is LRU cache will only execute this function one time. We don't want it to be executed over and over and over again, because then it'll just be keep on reading this .env file, which is redundant and not necessary. So now we're gonna go ahead and use this, bring it into our main app. And so I'll just do from config, import get settings, and right underneath our app declaration, we'll go ahead and do settings equals to get settings. And now I can actually access any of these items in here. So let's go ahead and just save it out. I'll print out settings.appdb and then we'll run uvicorn main and app dash dash reload. Oops, let's make sure that we are in the root of this project. And there we go, so dash dash reload. Notice that it says python.env is not installed. That's because of course I need to do pip install dash r requirements.txt. And I'll update the pip as well upgrade it. And so now it actually should work. And it looks like it's saying it's also still not installed. Let's make sure that that was saved. Perhaps that was why. Hmm, that's strange. Well, let's go ahead and give it a shot with this. I might need to refresh my virtual environment. So let me just exit out of here. And Navigate into the app, source bin slash activate, and try that again. So you via corn main app dash dash reload. There we go. Sometimes you just need to exit out of the virtual environment. And so here is that string. So that is, of course, coming in from the environment variables as well as this configuration. Now, this is going to become really important in the next part where we actually connect to the Postgres database itself. Um, but the main thing here is this is how we'll use environment variables in both places, both locally and in production. Now, before I go any further, I want to just verify that that even is a value on one of my, you know, things here. So I'm going to come in here and allow it to be none so that my server does not have a meltdown if it's not none. And so what I'm gonna do now is in my, let's say my ABC path, I'm just gonna go ahead and say settings or let's say DB is that, but we'll go ahead and say is not none. So really just checking if it's not none. So let's save it, 
should be still running locally. So let's go ahead and open up the local server. Go to slash ABC just to verify it locally. It does have the database. Great. So now I'll do git status. I've got all these updates. So I'll do git add dash dash all git commit added the db environment vars and git push all. Okay. So again, it should push to each one of those servers because I did not have to change the IP addresses, which is one of those convenient things. And so now if I refresh in here, I should be able to go to ABC and now it's saying false. Hmm. Okay. So one of the challenges with this is the fact that perhaps our environment variables are just not loading, or perhaps it would be better to have it in a .env file. That is something we will have to diagnose when we go further into production. Um, but at this point, at the very least, it's showing me that the database is not being read for some reason. So my initial intuition would be, okay, well, let me just jump in here and let's just verify that that's even a item, right? So again, verifying that my settings are correct. So let's go ahead and jump in. And again, Python 3, import os, os.environ.git, appdb, it is there. Hmm. So what's happening here? Well, the environment is, let's see, we have it in var, www, app, what do you know? Source bin slash activate. So Python again, import os, os.environ.git, app db. Hmm, that's strange. It actually is there. So there is clearly an issue with this settings module here. But it's not as obvious as it might seem. So if I actually run pip freeze here, what I'll see is there is, well, the actual requirement of python-env is not there. So that's certainly a challenge that we need to solve. The other part of this is the supervisor configuration. Now this command for gunicorn actually strips away environment variables. And so that would be really hard to figure out if you didn't know what you were looking for. So what we need to do then is number one, we need to install requirements.txt. And then we also need to create the .env file with the environment variable itself. So how do we do this? Well, hopefully your intuition is here, but even if it's not, it's in our Git repository on a remote here. So we're gonna CD into it. Then we're gonna CD into our hooks. We're gonna go ahead and nano our post receive here. And in here, this is where we wanna run everything. So the first one is var www app and bin, then python m, of course this is gonna be the pip module, then we do dash r, and roughly the same thing, but now just requirements.txt. Okay, so that's one start, that will give me the actual requirements that my project has. The next one is to, well, essentially make this .env file off of any given environment variable that I have. Now in this case, I only have one, so I can actually run this command called echo, and then I can create a .env file this way. And of course I want it in a specific path, so directly there. And to make this work, we have to echo the actual environment variable, which is appdb, and we're gonna set that equal to dollar sign curly brackets, and then appdb. So this will just be a string inside of .env, this will be substituted with the actual environment variable itself. So we'll go ahead and save that with control X, Y, and then enter. And now we can actually run that post receive again. And what this should do is run everything that we need. Okay, so I actually um, missed one part on the pip call, which maybe you got, but it's pip install dash R. Now we I'm gonna go ahead and run it again, okay? So this time it actually installs python.env. 
perhaps no surprise there. So now what I'll do is use supervisor CTL to restart my app. So sudo supervisor CTL, and we'll go ahead and do restart my app. It's not running and it started all over again. Refresh in here. Now it actually gives me that database value. Cool. So let's go ahead and exit out of our secure shell here. And I actually want to change something about this configuration and this should be app DB like this and then like this. The actual configuration itself will be able to infer that from here, which we could of course try out locally. So UV corn and main app reload and then jumping in to that, then going to ABC, all is right in the world. Okay, so that stripping of the environment variables does serve a very good purpose, and that is we don't want environment variables in our application that shouldn't be there, right? So the OS environment variables should never show up, and GUnicorn does that for us, which is, I think, really nice, but fairly frustrating if you don't know about it. Now, of course, this also now means that I have to yet again make another image of this web server. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this old one because I no longer need it. And I'm going to go ahead and create a new one. And we'll call this web app server. Updated requirements. Create image. Realistically, I probably would not delete the other one prior to creating a new one. I'd probably create the new one and then delete the other one, but I'll leave it in as that for now. And now these other web servers, I'm going to go ahead and power off. Again, this is another thing I probably wouldn't do when I'm full on in production because this one is being cloned. So it's possible that, you know, maybe it takes my site down. Let's go ahead and look. And I think it is right. So it's actually taking down these two things offline and the last server, oh, nope, still up. So even though it's being cloned, it looks like it is still running, which is cool, uh, but it's not gonna be running nearly as fast. So I certainly will finish these things off, but the idea is of course to now provision these servers again, and then transfer over the network IPs again. And realistically, what you would not be doing is this. You would actually have one web server until you get it right, until it's working well, and then you would add in your load balancer and do all those things. But um, we definitely wanted to see how it's all set up initially to get to a point where it's somewhat sustainable and also horizontally scaled. So I'm gonna go ahead and let this finish with the image and then we'll go ahead and create those other two and finish it off. Okay, the image was duplicated. So let's go ahead and make a couple new ones. Same region. That, that other password that I've been using. SSH keys. Go ahead and hit create. Let that run. Make a new one. Okay, there we go. So now those are provisioning. Let's see if I can change it while it's provisioning. I don't think I can, but we can try. Swap with web app server. Oh yeah, it looks like we can. Okay, so we'll go ahead and save that. Transferred successfully, great. And web app server three, network. IP transfer, swap with, web app server US West 2. Make sure you get the right one, otherwise you can be running in circles there. Okay, uh, and so now those should be the correct ones. I might have to reboot them again, even though they are just now provisioning, uh, but now I can go ahead and delete these again. So let's go ahead and, or again, or <laughs> finally. Okay, and so, reboot these. And after that reboots, we'll have a little test.
Okay, the final one is finishing rebooting. I'm gonna go ahead and make a little change to our requirements. So in here, what I will do is I'll add in our next two requirements, which are SQL Alchemy and the Postgres binary so that our actual web server application can connect to Postgres with Python and SQL Alchemy will be the way we write models and all sorts of cool stuff um, to make it really easy to add data and schemas with Python. Um, and so I just want to add that in as requirements. Now, if you remember back to when I was setting up the Postgres server, I did install a Postgres client on that server itself. So if I didn't do that in the past, I would have had to do that now too. But we'll go ahead and do that. Update this, updated requirements. Okay, and then let's go ahead and take a look, make sure it's running, looks like they are. So we'll do git push all. And what I should see now is three versions of the installs from these requirements. So from each one. So there's requirements.txt there. And then here's gonna be another one. Sure enough, there's another one. And then we'll have one final one as well. So that all of my three servers now have that. And hopefully now I can actually go on my Linode load balancer and actually see hello world um, with the database being true. And sure enough, all three servers are showing up as well.